ahead and get started with introducing our panel. You know, talking about unpredictability in this year in 2020. Now, I don't think most of us could have anticipated the global pandemic and how it would change the way that we do business overnight. As our community faced new challenges, it also presented an opportunity for researchers here in Oklahoma City to contribute to the ongoing discovery of how to create COVID safe communities, starting right here with Oklahoma City. Today, we're really excited to have Bruce Lawrence, founder of Lawrence Strategic Solutions, and he's a special advisor, a special advisor to the mayor on our community's COVID-19 response, um, to lead a discussion with researchers doing hands-on work as part of the START Coalition. The START Coalition is smart testing and analysis to return tomorrow. Um, their goal is to lessen the virus threat until we have a vaccine. Bruce Lawrence, thank you for being such a long-term friend to the chamber and thank you for being willing to do this with us today. Welcome. Well, thank you, Sonny, and it's a real pleasure to, uh, to be here and thank everyone for uh, logging in. It would be much better if we could be in person and hopefully if we can uh, do the things that uh, we know we need to do, we can be back to that personal uh, position very soon. Can you still hear me, Sonny? My screen went blank. You sound and look phenomenal. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the START Coalition, you may have read a little bit about it. And uh, so we're here today to share some more information about what START is, the things that the START is doing, uh, using Oklahoma City as the first place in the country to, uh, to develop some of this. The mission of START is to deploy, evaluate, and share a suite of pra pragmatic interventions to build and sustain COVID safe and really COVID free communities in the future. Uh, these interventions are led by some of the greatest and boldest medical, scientific, public health, economic, technology, academic and business leaders and they're all underpinned by data and, I, and you'll hear that today uh, over and over again but the data element of this is vitally important. So building the foundation started selected a group of socio uh, economically diverse communities, each facing uh, the same challenge and together we'll learn from one another. Uh, Oklahoma City, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, Indianapolis, and there are other cities that are coming on board and uh, it's all this sharing of information is going to be very important. The basic focus of start is to stop the virus, uh, to start the work, and to keep the work open and to keep your employees and your customers safe. And then to, for schools to, to open campuses and keep the campuses open. And I think we all know the importance of that as well. You know, we're gonna accomplish this in working in coordination with all the other public health entities and the healthcare providers by doing smart testing. And there's a, a real focus on defining the role of antibody testing that starts gonna have a role in. Uh, contact tracing and implementation, again, is vitally important. Uh, germicidal light disinfection and environmental testing, and you're gonna hear some more about that today, and the importance of how that fits into an overall mitigation strategy. And then data assessment, and then the what if projections. So today it's my pleasure to introduce three of the individuals that are providing a lot of the leadership uh, for START, and I'm gonna have them elaborate a little bit more on the work to date and then what to expect in the coming weeks and months for us here in Oklahoma City and other cities around the, the country. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Salman um, Kishabji, who is Professor of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Uh, he is also a physician at the Boston Brigham and Women's Hospital and a senior TV specialist at Partners Health. Today, Salman will cover the impact of the airborne spread of COVID-19 virus and ways to mitigate that spread. Following Salman will be Dr. Jason Sanders. Jason is the Senior Vice President and Provost of the University of Oklahoma Health Science Center with the overall responsibility for its seven colleges and clinical educational and research programs. He also serves as Vice Chair of the OU Medicine Health System. Jason will cover the testing strategies in place across our state, the current work of the Oklahoma City County Health Department in conjunction with the State Health Department, as well as some of the positivity rates that are currently being seen around the state. And then Mark Beffert. Mark is President and CEO of Robinson Park, 
a preeminent property management firm based here in Oklahoma City with assets in six other states. And Mark will discuss UBC Light Initiative and the role that it can play to create safer facilities. In addition, he'll also touch upon the additional measures, including cleaning and mechanical maintenance. So with that, I'll turn it over to Salman. He will uh, be the first presenter, followed by Jason, and then by Mark, and then we'll leave time for questions for the end. So, uh, Salman? Right, thank you, Bruce, and thank you, Sunny, and, and everyone for the very kind invitation. It's really nice to meet everyone virtually. I'm going to share uh, a slide set with you and hope for the best that it actually works. So give me one second. And Are you seeing the presentation mode? It's not the presentation mode yet. It looks like you've just got the PowerPoint open. Your uh, bookshelf behind you in your image is um, as good as Cindy's fake bookshelf was <laughs> <laughs> in her background. It's very, very impressive. Thank you. Okay, how about now? It looks like we can still just see your view. Oh, what a shame. So okay. we were talking earlier about this, about trying to do it from the two screens. I have had, I've had a hard time doing that when I've needed to do it. It's a little yeah. bit different. Murphy's Law, of course, that I'm in front of a chamber of commerce. You're not going to believe another word that I'm saying if I can't <laughs> give a slide to you, I'm sure. Hold on, let me try once more. And then if not, we'll have to try something. Else. We just enjoy the opportunity to see your nice bookshelf again. <laughs> okay, how about this? This looks, this looks like your screen, but. Okay, you know what, I'm just gonna do one more thing and I'm gonna, give me one second. Do you have an option to switch which screen you're sharing? Yeah, you know, it, it, it lets me do that, but as I, as I get, give me one second and I'll do that. Thank you. We are really lucky to have these experts here together today. How about that? And an expert screen sharer too. That's perfect. It worked? Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to talk a bit about the START Coalition. And I know we've got, you know, uh, uh, Bruce and Sunny both gave <clears throat> background to what we've been doing. Uh, and I'm going to talk mostly about UV lights. But I just want to tell you, our goal from the very beginning has been how to make public spaces safe from COVID-19. Uh, by using layers of effective interventions. And <clears throat> I've been working in the area of tuberculosis, which is an airborne infectious disease for more than 20 years. And when COVID started, you know, uh, our, our group realized, oh, wow, there's so many similarities in the things that we've done to stop the spread of tuberculosis that we could probably use for COVID. We also realized very early on that if we don't do this rapidly, and I, and I think we haven't done it rapidly enough, if we don't do it rapidly, we are not going to be able to uh, avert a crisis in the business community with businesses and restaurants and other people going out of business and of course, great loss of jobs. And so I think there's an element of urgency to this goal um, that we all you know, need to keep our eye on. So if you start looking at, at, at this whole, at COVID, whose official name is SARS-CoV-2, you know, how is it transmitted? Because if you want to transmit, if you want to stop transmission, in a public space. So if you want to keep the public space safe, if you want to keep businesses and schools open, you got to figure out how to interfere with these. And, you know, for a long time, people have said that it was mostly droplets. And droplets, you don't have to worry about the, the sizes, but droplets kind of spread over a six feet distance. They're slightly bigger particles than what we now think is one of the major routes, which is aerosols. Aerosols kind of linger in the air. And then fomites are what go on, you know, the surface so that, you know, somebody touches the surface or somebody coughs and things fall on the surface and then you come and touch it and you get COVID. And so when you start to try to make sense of this, you have to ask yourself, well, what does it look like? Like, what am I trying to interfere with? And this is what you're trying to interfere with. There are these large droplets. Like, so if somebody were to cough, which is, sorry, sneeze, which is the top, the top little bar there, um, you kind of see this gas cloud. Uh, you know, that with aerosols that just kind of stay in the air and come out. And then there's all these droplets that fall onto the ground over time. If somebody coughs, you see that it's less than a sneeze, but it still like runs out, you know, a certain number of, of feet. So this is, this, this graphic is in meters. So the two meters is roughly six feet. And then if somebody's just talking to you, exhaling, 
not singing, not yelling or anything. It's still about one meter, which is three feet or so, right? And so you have to ask, how do we interfere with this? How do we break, break this cycle? And so we started looking at all the ways that you could do this, right? So you could have administrative control. So let's say I'm running a restaurant or a bank or something. I would have people check their temperature in the morning, report symptoms, you know, do certain things like that. There's surface cleaning, there's social distancing, there's obviously things like PPE, so masks and, and things like that, that can interrupt you know, the, the transmission. Um, there's targeted testing, of course, and, and we're trying to do every one of these, but I'm gonna talk mostly about the next two, but there's targeted testing so that you can identify people who may have it so that they don't come to work. You know, the, the Oklahoma City is considering mobile units for active case finding. And then there's the question of, how do I make the space around people safe? And there's two ways to do it that I wanna spend some time talking about. There's air quality, just changing the air in a room. And then there's the use of upper room UVC germicidal lighting. And then of course, there's always our hope of a vaccine. Uh, you know, vaccination is really, really important. Uh, but most vaccines, like the flu vaccine, works 40 to 60% of the time. And so it's good, it's, it's, a, it's important. Uh, it'll protect people who are very, very vulnerable, but it really is one layer in this whole thing. So today, given the time that we have, I'm gonna talk about these two layers, air quality and upper room UV lighting. So in order to kind of clean up the air in a room, like let's say you're, you have a Starbucks, you wanna have more than six air exchanges per hour, and ideally more than 10 air exchanges per hour. And so you can set HVAC systems to pump fresh air into a space and eject all the this, all this stale air. Uh, but in order to, to get to the six or 10 air exchanges an hour, not only do you need a very powerful HVAC, not only does it really make uh, uh, sounds, like you know, you, you'd hear it, uh, but it, you'd also feel it because it's just a lot of air exchanges to be taking place to change the entire uh, room. And of course, you have to cool it where it's hot, you got to heat it where it's cold. So, you know, it's, 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 it's more costly. Other people have said, well, why don't we put in filters? Like you, you've heard people talking about MERV 13 filters and other things. Well, that stops the particles of the size that I was showing you, things that are less than five micrometers or more. So it stops about 90% of the, of, the uh, of the particles. And, and so that can be effective, but what, there's some problems with that. One is that the, the filters actually reduce the flow, right? You can imagine that if you're going through a filter, your flow rate is not gonna be as high. And so, you know, you end up with less air exchanges. And so this is what it looks like visually, right? Like if somebody's coughing and there's stuff in the air, you wanna get rid of it, um, you know, and what will you do? Well, you'll probably open the window or you'll have, you know, air exchanges where it sucks up, sucks up air away from people uh, and it'll reduce the burden of, of bugs in the air, it'll dilute it. And this is true for COVID, this is true for the flu, this is true for the disease I work in, tuberculosis, that you know, if you open the windows and you have air exchanges, it makes the air cleaner. Then there's a technology that's been around since the 1940s, and that's upper room UVC germicidal lighting. So we've all heard of UV light, right? Because we use it, you know, we wear sunglasses to protect ourselves from it. If you get too much UVA, or UVB lighting, you sometimes can get skin cancer, it can hurt your eyes. But there's a range of UV light called UVC lighting. It's usually blocked, we don't actually deal with it that much. And UVC lighting does not penetrate the skin and it actually does not penetrate the cornea. So it doesn't, it can't make you blind, it can't cause cancer. Um, it can irritate your eyes if you stare at it for a long time. Uh, but basically it kills bacteria and viruses. It's able to penetrate their very thin coats. Um, and it, so in the 1940s, when there were these measles outbreaks that were affecting children in schools, um, schools in the Philadelphia area started using upper room UVC lighting. So this is, this is uh, light that you put higher than where people are. And what it does is it, each of us is kind of like a light bulb. We produce heat and air rises from our body. And so what happens is that you, you uh, as that air rises, if it goes into a place where the UV lights are, it can basically kill bacteria in the air and then it recirculates down. And it's been shown to be very effective against the SARS virus. So here's what it looks like visually. You know, somebody uh, will, will release bug in the air, it gets moved upward by the HVAC system or just a fan, basically. 
uh, a simple fan, the UV light hits it and it reduces the amount of bugs in the room. And this is really important, right? Because if you put this UV light inside the HVAC, then it's not protecting you while you're in the room. It's either protecting you on the way out or on the way in of, of air, but it's not, it's not protecting the other people in the room who might be standing there. So that's where you know, UVC lighting is really, really uh, important. When they used it in schools in, um, in the Philadelphia area in the 1940s, it basically stopped the transmission of measles in those communities. So it was startling. And, and since then, it's been used for a variety of diseases. It's been used directly, like when you shine it directly on things to, you know, to sterilize operating rooms and other things. And it's been used indirectly to clean the air in the room. And the beauty is that because it's cleaning the air as it circulates around the room, it gives you the, it takes something that's like three air exchanges an hour, and it gives you the equivalent of around 20 air exchanges an hour. So it's really quite, quite incredible. And, you know, this isn't the first time people have been thinking about it. Here's a, a graphic of an airport, you know, during the H1N1 epidemic. Or could you, could you put uh, this, this type of light uh, in the high reaches of, a, of, a, of an airport to, to ensure that the air would be clean? For years, it's been used in patient rooms, right? And again, it's got these louvered fixtures so that the light doesn't shine down, it only shines across. And so it really doesn't bother anybody. And it essentially sterilizes the air in the room. And because it's light, it's happening at the speed of light. And if you have air circulating in the room, either with a fan or an HVAC, it basically sterilizes the room in under a minute. So as part of START, we are working on this in Oklahoma City. We're looking, you know, we're doing some research with, with OU, uh, looking at the better, better understanding uh, how it deactivates COVID-19. So we're doing some experiments to look at what doses it will deactivate COVID-19. And as it kills it in the air, it reduces the amount that drops down onto surfaces. So it might actually reduce that 10 or 15% that, that of disease that comes from touching things that are contaminated. And we're also, we've also been doing a, a community-based implementation in OKC, which is, you know, how to make congregate spaces safer. So we um, have linked up with three churches, uh, a, a synagogue, a mosque, um, and, a, and five homeless shelters. And we're going to, we've started by installing these UV lights into homeless shelters, mostly because homeless shelters have actually been using these in other parts of the country since the 1980s since there were outbreaks of tuberculosis in New York and Miami and San Francisco and other places. And so people, you know, homeless shelters and people who have been running homeless shelters, and people who've been running hospitals, people who've been running prisons are used to this technology. So we, we, we started uh, at the Salvation Army of Central Oklahoma. They've been our first partner. And I just wanna show you some pictures and what's been achieved there. We brought in one of the world experts on this, uh, two of the world experts. One is Dr. Ed Nardell from Boston and Dr. Paul Jensen, who actually came to OKC. Uh, he basically ran training sessions in OKC um, and, and trained people there to think about, you know, how do you, how do you position the lights? How many do you put in a room? You know, how much light do you need? Because you have to have the right dosage. Uh, to kill bugs, but not too much that it might irritate somebody's eyes. Uh, you know, you uh, how do you install the fixtures? Um, and this is what what we what we did. We installed lights in 14 rooms: in the dining rooms, in the clinic, in the common room, in the dorms, in the reception areas. And again, you can see they're pretty unobtrusive. Um, here, here's people working on preparing the lights for installations, and it can be installed by an electrician. It's just a regular bulb. The fixtures are you know, about $100, $150, $200 a fixture. Um, here's somebody, screw, you know, getting it all set up. Here's the clinic with it in it as well on the, on the bottom right. Here uh, is the social services reception area. And you can see that one light can cover a lot of area because again, it's, it's light and it's, it's, it's based on, on air moving around the room and just this constant, uh, constant irradiation. Uh, using this, this safe form of, of UV light. Here's the, uh, the dinner area, so where people congregate. And again, as people speak to each other or eat, that's the most dangerous time, right? Because you're close to people and you're not, you, you don't have a mask or you're not six feet away. This pulls the, the HVAC pulls the air away from people and the UV light just zaps it so it's clean. 
uh, here's you know the various corridors of the space. So you know if you if you if you go to the Salvation Army building now, it's probably one of the safest buildings in OKC, and I'd probably venture to, to say it's probably one of the safest buildings in the country. Now you're probably asking, well, what does this cost? Like, is this super expensive? Uh, the answer is no. It's it's the average cost is three dollars and sixty cents per square foot. Uh, some places that we've we've mapped out and priced out, it's cheaper. It's about two sixty. And if you have a very complex place like a cathedral type church, which with different alcoves and other things that light can't get to easily, it can go up to you know around nine dollars uh, uh, a square foot. But in general, it's three dollars and sixty cents a square foot for the fixtures and the electrical costs. Um, you know, not including any carpentry costs or other costs that you may have. So it's really really quite affordable. So that's one of the main projects we've been working on in OKC. And again, it's part of a layer of interventions that I believe is going to allow us to open up. Uh, Bruce mentioned already there's work on contact tracing. There's some people wearing masks. There's you know, a lot of work being done on targeted testing and better testing, as you'll hear from Jason shortly. Uh, there's hope that a vaccine will come out. But in the, in the midst of that, we've got this technology that's tried, that's tested that's 80 years old and that is available for us to, uh, to, to, to do what we need to do. So thank you very much. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, Jason Sanders, uh, thanks very much to Dr. Kashavji uh, for sharing work on UV lighting. You didn't hear more about that uh, from Mark uh, following some comments I'm going to make. Uh, and really for everyone on the session, as you're thinking about your businesses, um, very tactical application, uh, which I know is one of the goals for this session. Uh, I'm going to cover uh, a few items. Uh, and to start off, uh, just want to talk about framing uh, start coalition in relation to Oklahoma City. Uh, I think that this, and for the Chamber's involvement, uh, Oklahoma City really stands out. It's our history of bringing together business leaders, government leaders in the city of Oklahoma City, uh, and the medical community. Uh, our partnership with Oklahoma City County Health Department, OU and OMRF, and national leaders such as Salman. So, uh, this is important uh, because as we're addressing COVID, as the chamber thinks about Ford, Oklahoma City and other initiatives, this is an opportunity for us to compete relative to other cities and how we achieve public health together and economic growth, uh, which you heard in the preparatory remarks is a the guiding principle start coalition. And to touch again on public health and economic growth uh, and getting back to business, START really believes that these are mutually supportive uh, and, and far from mutually exclusive. We recognize that economic restoration, diversification and growth relies critically on consumer demand, which is your reality day to day. Consumers need to have a threshold of feeling safe uh, to use your business. Uh, regardless of bottom line, someone has to choose to come into your store, even if it's remote, uh, to have a comfort level, to use your services, buy your products. Uh, and START, we feel, has, has recognized that uh, and is trying to create a series of science-based tools, tactics uh, that you can use as you leave this session and to stay tuned with the work that we're doing. You can deploy uh, to help consumers feel safe. Uh, so much of our economy do, uh, depends on that consumer spending. Trust is important. Uh, it's been so challenging throughout COVID of who you can trust. Uh, that will be ongoing. It will be ongoing in the months ahead. And that's really what I've appreciated about working in the partnerships we have in Oklahoma City with the Chamber of the Start Coalition. Uh, hopefully you will uh, see in what we shared before and certainly today, the transparency uh, really enjoyed uh, working with Bruce, Salman, Mark, others who couldn't be on the call today, uh, Steve Prescott, uh, Christian Kennedy, a number of individuals, national partners at 
the conversation has been very straightforward. They're transparent, they're database, they're fact-based, um, going with those guiding principles that public health helps business get back to business. Uh, and this will continue. So COVID, we don't know how it will change in the future. It will improve. Uh, it will have a variety of outcomes, uh, but it will certainly get better from where it is today. But throughout the 21st century, there will be more infectious disease outbreaks across the world. And if you look at the supply side of your businesses, your healthy workforce, even aside from infectious diseases, we've all had that mirror put in front of us with great sadness, a disproportionate impact of COVID on people with chronic d diseases and on frontline workers. So this is something that's been on your minds, the chamber's minds, as you look at your health insurance, and the premiums you pay, but really critically to getting back to business, public health is critical for your workforce um, to be resilient and whatever comes next, if it's an infectious disease outbreak or whatnot. You saw uh, on some on slide, the structured way that we look at managing COVID uh, and really exciting work on UVC lighting. Uh, I think for those who've heard it from the first time or seen that powerful graphic that Salman shared, uh, that's the science of how COVID spreads. A sneeze, a cough, talking, I'm talking in a computer screen right now, but if you had that, uh, that flashlight basically to shine a light on the droplets that I'm exhaling now, that, that's the reality. And you're trying to get everyday evidence of, you know, what's the risk, how do you manage it? Uh, so really excited about UVC lighting, certainly for prevention, uh, we've been supportive of masks and we can start to see the data now in areas where there's more mask usage and the declining transmission and prevention as well. Uh, mentioned vaccines, uh, START coalition broadly has looked at BCG vaccines. Uh, locally, START Coalition is looking at something called the Shingrix vaccine, and we're going to do a clinical trial in long-term care facility. Shingrix is given for uh, shingles, uh, already indicated to see if it stimulates the immune system to fight COVID. Uh, and at OU locally, we did preclinical work on a Novavax vaccine that's going to later stage clinical trials. Uh, as Bruce mentioned, testing, that's been an important part of START Coalition. Uh, the provision of viral testing, the PCR test, and that's uh, particularly been a collaboration locally with OU, OMRF, and the Oklahoma City County Health Department. It's been research on antibody tests, questions that everyone has. How much immunity do antibodies provide? How does it vary across different populations and for how long? That's research that's being done through START, OMRF, and OU. Uh, just in the spirit of transparency of, of testing as you think about this for your businesses in particular if you have businesses oklahoma is a, a, a city greater oklahoma city is very large uh, by land coverage very different uh, geographies and neighborhoods and then certainly if you have businesses across the state what what's the risk in your area and trying to get uh, and a sense of that just from the overall trajectory uh, for everyone on the call, we started out, let's say in April, a percent positive of all the tests done in the state, just the, the high level for Oklahoma, were about 5% in mid-April. Uh, the lowest value was about 1.8% at the end of May, and it crept upwards and upwards and upwards. Uh, the most recent peak is 11.4% statewide uh, percent uh, viral tests that are positive. And right now, I'd say we're at a plateau around 10%. We're still awaiting the full effects of the K through 12 school fall semester, which is in various formats and the Labor Day holiday. We think that testing is key to strategy. So certainly encourage you to make use of the swab pods that are available, the Oklahoma City County Health Department. Uh, again, that's a, a partnership of those with OU Medical Lab and OMRF. Uh, encourage uh, your workforce, uh, certainly with any symptoms or as you screen for uh, individuals who may have been exposed uh, to use testing, that enables then contact tracing. Really want to compliment Oklahoma City County Health Department 
and our start partners both at Harvard and Duke who've been on the ground at some of the sites Salman has mentioned, bringing expertise and know-how to contact tracing. It's, it is something where you need uh, resources, just number of individuals to, to make the calls, but there's also an expertise and know-how, certainly for those of you who have businesses uh, with call centers, it's the interaction you have with those on the other end, and this is a very serious and difficult issue to communicate. Uh, you know, someone we recommend that, that you know, let us know who, who you've been uh, around that might have been exposed, and, and on the other end of the call, we think you might have been exposed to recommending testing. Also with contact tracing, and this is uh, work uh, with START Coalition looking at sewage and wastewater surveillance. So uh, this is a very uh, old public health technique, goes back centuries, uh, but to get early signs, early indicators of where COVID may be spreading in a local area. Uh, to round out, as we talked about prevention, testing, contact tracing, and, and treatment uh, at, at OU, uh, as a member of the coalition, we're the first health system to provide convalescent serum treatment in Oklahoma. Uh, since then, things like dexamethasone have really stood out as treatments for patients who need hospitalization, who are coming on low oxygen levels, participating in on-guard rim disappear. Uh, we'll just conclude my remarks where I started. Two things, uh, I think Oklahoma City really stands out for the history and the current partnerships of business, government, and the healthcare community based upon uh, transparency, building trust, being pragmatic. Uh, and the second thing is I hope that everything here today is helpful as you go back to your businesses. Uh, I'm really excited for what Mark's gonna share about UBC lighting. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, uh, Salman, and Bruce. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to follow the, uh, the two uh, smart guys in the room. The IQ just went down significantly with my discussion here. But this, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's been humbling to be part of the START Coalition. I would say, you know, it started with an idea from a gentleman named Christian Kennedy. And uh, one of the first people we called were Bruce Lawrence and, uh, and uh, being from Integris and his current consulting firm and the mayor and Bruce, thank you for donating your time to ensure that our city stays safe. And, uh, and then getting to work with Steve Prescott and Jason Sanders uh, and Solomon and there's many others that are a part of this. And we've had many many smart individuals come to our city that you haven't seen that are working behind the scenes to ensure our city is safe. And it's, it's really tr truly remarkable to see that happen. Um, you know, I'm, I, I, uh, I got involved here because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we can do all the things be scientifically, but it's how we implement that. And uh, being in the real estate business, I felt that we had the ability to impact people's lives in a greater fashion by implementing some of these things within facilities, not just commercial facilities, but as you're talking about the Salvation Army, uh, we need to think about everyone within our society from the homeless to as we go back to church and things like that. So as Solomon said, uh, the UV light was one of the uh, you know, main factors that we got, got, got hooked on. And we've actually taken that concept and there are other things that we can do behind the scenes as well. Uh, Salman mentioned the uh, MERV filters and I'll get to that here in a second, but there are other things you can do with the UV light and that is actually placing the UV light on coils in your mechanical systems to ensure that you kill any bacteria that get through the system that gets recirculated. When you get into commercial facilities, you have a lot of different type of mechanical facilities. So one size doesn't fit all. So you really need to understand this, how the UV light can work within a particular situation. Then also you can use that UV light within your air handling units. Um, you know, there are different types of system, whether it's a VAV system, which is a variable air volume system that's just pumping air throughout a building. So making sure that you treat that air in, a, in an effective manner to ensure that you kill whatever bacteria you can. And then as Solomon said, you talked about the, the UV light up in the ceiling and that's very practical and we, we do that. So those are really the three forms of the UV light. Um, 
Then we get into the mechanical systems. Alma mentioned about the MERV filters. Most commercial buildings use MERV filters in the, I think MERV filters go up to like a 16, which is a very, very high, high dense type of filter. And you really have to have a special mechanical system. And most hospitals use a MERV 16 filter system. But most commercial facilities are using MERV filters in the MERV 3, 4, 5 range, which really doesn't do a whole lot of good to really uh, uh, trap uh, all viruses or anything, particles that run through the air. So uh, we, we firmly believe going to MERV 13 filter is, uh, is, is important and, and we're working to try to see how we implement that as a standard throughout the city. One of the things we're trying to do is come up with a, a healthy building certification. And what that does is uh, it helps people, it gives people a guideline to develop things that they can do to ensure that their facility is safer. Uh, we, we firmly believe in, in creating a healthy, safe, clean, and green environment. And uh, we also uh, working on all the touch points because I'm a firm believer that once per perception is the reality and we need to make sure that we're doing all the things that they see that makes that and they feel safer as well as do the things behind the scene to ensure that it's safe. So we look at every touch point that people enter within our facilities and that would mean what they see. And when they see that is you see signs that ensuring that we're a safe facility. And they see that you have sanitation cleaning devices. They see people wearing masks. They see that you have policies and procedures. Uh, what, people, what people are actually able to taste, what they smell, what they hear, what they feel. All those things are important to us to get the perception that an, a, a person visiting a facility feels they're safe in that particular environment. And also part of the uh, certification is how do you treat your visitors? How do you treat your vendors to ensure that every vendor is required to test their employees before they enter the building? And if they're sick, they stay at home. Making sure that all of the employees that actually work in the facility are tested on a continual basis. And if they're not feeling well or have any systems, they stay at home. So those are the things that we're working to try to ensure that we um, provide that perception that you have a clean, safety, healthy environment. Then it gets that down to all the products. What type of uh, hand sanitizer are you using? How often are you cleaning your facility? Do you have day porters within your facility that are cleaning all the touch points on a continual basis? Uh, a couple of other things that we're looking at doing is uh, in the mechanical systems, uh, as Solomon mentioned, bringing in as much fresh air as you can. We all would love to have 100% fresh air, and that's what we're using for our building. But in really, the heat of the winter, I mean, the, the, the heat of the summer and the really cold days, you can't bring in as much fresh air as you want. And then also maintaining or uh, maintaining a, the relative humidity within a building between 40 and 60 is very important because that's the maximum area that you can actually uh, in control any particles that run through the facility. And lastly, I'll say that we're working on an in cab elevator air purification test with a product to it that you would install on the elevators because when you get in an elevator it's hard to maintain that six feet distance is it or even that two foot distance so the idea is to ensure that you have air purification systems within the elevators to uh provide again a safe healthy environment so Appreciate the time, and I'm walk it looks like uh, sunny. Uh, I went over, but it looks like we're at 1246, and we're supposed to be done at 1245. So That's pretty dead on, Mark. Thank you, and thanks to all of our panelists um, and to Bruce for all the insight that you've shared today. As we said at the beginning, we think we'll have quite a few questions for this group, so we wanted to make sure that we had 10 or 15 minutes here to work on that. If you would like to ask a question, there are two ways that you can do it. One is you can use the participant window to raise your hand, and then we'll call on you to ask your own question aloud. The other is to type your message into the chat window, and I'll ask it for you. Uh, the rest of the events team is helping 
let me keep an eye on that. If you would like to ask a question anonymously and don't want to chat it directly uh, to the whole group, you can chat it, chat it to me privately uh, or to Kaylee or Meredith or Delina, and we'll get that question asked for you. So it looks like we have had some questions come in here. And I think, um, actually, Mark, this first question is for you. Um, with your background in commercial real estate, what made you decide to get involved with START? Um, I got a call from Christian Kennedy, who had the idea. And I, um, I'll tell you, Christian is a dreamer, but he is, he's one that uh, really has some fantastic ideas, and he was concerned about it. And, and, and I was too, and uh, because uh, I, from a real estate guy, I believe I have the ability to impact people's lives far greater than anything else they do in their day. People spend eight to 10, 12 hours a day with me and my facilities. And I think it's incumbent upon me to ensure I provide a safe, healthy environment for them. And when, and when uh, he had this idea, uh, it, was, it was a quick yes. And, um, and it was a, uh, a financial commitment I was willing to make. Thank you. That is a, a meaningful answer. Will you explain really quickly who Christian is? He's, he's my neighbor and your neighbor. Um, but for those who don't live, don't work in our neighborhood, who is Christian? Christian Kennedy is a millennial, I'll say. He's a young kid. He is uh, one of the smart guys within our city. He is, uh, um, you know, he, he owns Echo Resources. Uh, he's been in the oil and gas business for many years. Uh, worked at Chesapeake for a while. Uh, Start Echo. He is downtown. He bought the uh, Parkside building, which is now called the Zig, and he is uh, in, in investing his uh, future in the uh, innovation of uh, moving our city forward through the uh, medical industry. Thank you, Mark. This next question um, actually looks like it's for you too, Mark. This is from Debra Youngblood, who would like to know, will these changes become part of all commercial real estate moving forward after the pandemic eases? If, if I have any say about it, absolutely. But unfortunately, real estate is a private matter and not everyone can be forced. And unfortunately, it comes with a price tag. Uh, as Solomon mentioned, you know, to, to install the lights for the upper level lights, it's, there's a price tag to it. Uh, in changing all your filters to MERV 13 filters, there's a price tag. Uh, changing to filters, because uh, as you get to these filters, they become thicker and thicker and thicker. Not all existing mechanical systems are able to do that. I do believe, in my opinion, that if, in fact, you're not willing to make changes to provide a healthy safety environment, you, your particular piece of real estate will not thrive. So I think it's incumbent upon everyone to do it from a city standpoint, uh, it's an ethical standpoint, uh, but it, it, uh, uh, it, it remains to be seen. Thank you. Patrick Raglow has a question. Um, I think this could be for everyone, or Mark, this could be for you too. Can we start doing this now, or is there a shortage of supplies or options? You can start, you can start now, uh, Patrick, because so right now there's no shortage. Um, the, there's, there's a couple of companies that make these specialized bulbs and the fixtures. Um, the actual shortage is that you, people need an engineer to come and kind of see where to place them and then, and then commission them. Like somebody has to come with this little sensor to, to, to test that the dosage of the light is correct. Um, so th those are actually the bottlenecks, interestingly, like mapping it out and then somebody coming to, the, you, to say, yeah, it's okay to, to use it. Um, and, and in fact, you know, we've started thinking from the start perspective that this is actually an opportunity. Like if we want to do this in every school, if we want to do this in, 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 in restaurants, if you want to do this in gyms, if you want to do this in cafes, you know, I showed you certain types of, of UV lights. There's other forms as well that I didn't go into just in the interest of time, but you know, there's, there's different options, but what the real gap is the people that will actually implement it. So just like when HVAC started, you know, there were very few HVAC companies and now there's tons of them. We need to build up so that there could be many companies that are doing this and different suppliers making things and, and more competition in this space. 
But right now, if you started, you're getting in early, do it. <laughs> thank you, thank you for saying so. This is a question for Dr. Sanders. Do you have any thoughts about the possibility of COVID cases increasing as we get into colder weather or the cold and flu season? Is there anything that businesses need to do differently to help combat the spread during this time? Great question. Uh, traditionally, flu season coincides with colder weather, people being indoors more. Uh, so that will be a risk. A lot of our interventions over the summer and for businesses uh, have been accessing the outdoors. Some of the solutions are exactly what we heard today, however, of, of anticipating a winter indoor environment, uh, the management through UVC lighting, the management through filtration and your HVACs. Um, I think for some businesses, it'll, if you have been able to operate utilizing outdoors, um, it just may be tighter logistics. Um, if you think about some business already are really managing and Mark mentioned this vendors, it's just, it, as we're all looking at the world differently, it, it's kind of a, a operational analysis of your business, who comes in, who comes out, where do people move, where are things positioned? And some of you may have already have done that. Uh, and you've seen a lot of planning for that in schools, but if you haven't and you're relying on some uh, more outdoor space that you had, that's a change you need to plan for during the winter. Uh, also during the winter months, uh, as you mentioned for flu season itself, uh, the flu was less prevalent in the Southern hemisphere. Uh, it then migrates to the Northern hemisphere in any given year. The flu is challenging because it mutates. Uh, it mutates actually faster than COVID does. So it's always a, a, a guess about what particular strain will circulate. Uh, one thing you can do, uh, if you've never considered a flu shot before, really encourage uh, you and, and working with your HR group uh, and employee health, uh, however you do that, given the size of your business, small or large, uh, think about a flu shot this year. Those are easier to access. Uh, at least manage what you can manage. Flu shots have varying degrees of effectiveness, uh, but they at least reduce the severity because uh, it, it, that helps on a number of levels. So let's say someone just has the flu, uh, but they're having a runny nose, they're coughing and sneezing more, just adds more uncertainty in your business environment and managing it. Uh, on the clinical side, uh, we're hoping to have access to both flu and COVID testing. And we don't know what percentage of people will have both, uh, but our concern is if you have both, it puts you at greater risk. Uh, so hopefully there's a few things. I, I think that's an inflection point that's coming up. I would just close by saying we'll see in the next few weeks uh, how Labor Day impact is. Uh, we'll see in a few weeks, again, how the K through 12, which is a variety of, of ways in which that's happening, uh, occurs. I think after those, the next big inflection point is flu. And that varies. Uh, sometimes it can start as early as November. Sometimes it gets started later in December, certainly January and February, those are high months and then the tail differs. So if that helps at all for kind of the sequencing of the fall, you should kind of get a sense. I think we're at a plateau now overall. Next couple of weeks, you'll see what happens in that plateau. Then you have a period of time until flu season starts. Dr. Sanders, do you know when we can expect flu shots to be available? When should we start? looking to get out? Uh, some are available now. Uh, there's two available and particularly uh, if you're older would encourage the higher dose flu vaccine. Um, and I know those are available in pharmacies in my clinic in internal medicine last week. We didn't have the high dose yet. We're expecting it this week. Uh, but those should be available and, and really sooner as uh, soon as possible uh, is best, but really try to get that done by end of October, roughly, we say two weeks for them to kind of get your immune system ready. And, and to go again, this highlighted it since the virus mutates, that's why you have to get the vaccine every year, different than your childhood vaccination. So uh, your local pharmacy, uh, if you have a primary care physician, they'll have them. Uh, and we're going to be participating as well in a lot of get out the message of vaccination efforts and we'll have partnership with the city on that. Uh, 
Sonny, this is Bruce. If, if we've got just a moment, I'd, I'd really be interested in Jason and Salvin opining a little bit on the, the COVID vaccine and what their thoughts are about that. Great question. We have about three minutes, so that can be our last question. Thank you, Bruce. Salman, do you want to start? Well, I guess we're seeing a few ups and downs with the vaccines, but I, I, I'm guessing that out of all the candidates, there will be some vaccine that comes out probably at the end of the year or early next year, assuming the trials go well. The trial that we just saw this week get suspended is typical of trials, right? Sometimes things happen, you have to investigate before you move forward. So it's really hard to be like, oh, we got to get this done in three months or four months, even though we do have to get it done in three or four months. So there is that, that element. I do want to just pick up on something that, that Jason said, which I think is critical. Um, the flu, he said the flu uh, virus mutates more than COVID does. But the COVID virus also can mutate. And, and already there's about 30 odd strains that, you know, the vaccine covers all of them. But God forbid there's the possibility that there could be a strain that it doesn't. And even when people take the flu vaccine, it really protects, you know, 40 to 60% of the people. So this is the, depending on who you are and your age and a number of other factors. So I just, you know, I want to caution everyone that if we're waiting for this magic vaccine to appear, I don't think it's going to be the answer. I think we're going to have to be thinking in layers for a few years to come. And Jason brought up the flu, it kills 40 to 60,000 people a year. So, you know, just put doing the stuff that we're talking about, obviously we're not going to wear masks for the rest of our lives, but having clean air and, and having, a, you know, a, say upper room UV light or UV in your ducts or whatever you're doing, it's gonna, those things are gonna be helpful with a lot of viruses and will protect us as an important layer. Absolutely. Uh, vaccines, we're all optimistic. Uh, they'll be part of the response to COVID. We don't know to what extent, but that's why the comprehensive approach now with our discussion today, we've already been doing going forward is key. Secondarily, you should have the commitment on behalf of START, certainly on behalf of OU, uh, this has come up a lot past two weeks. You have our commitment to be transparent of what we know and don't know of vaccines, uh, what we believe about them, and to share with you changes as we know information. I think it's critical. Trust, as I mentioned earlier, with the business community, and then you have local institutions with a national network of individuals who are committed to discovering a vaccine, getting it into the management, but providing exactly what we know and don't know. Sonny, just one last thing I'd like to add is uh, we, we want START to be a resource for the business community and the community in, in general. And the website is start-coalition.org. And uh, it's not as robust today as it will be because we'll start to have a lot of the data and the results of uh, the, the studies that are going on and then things that businesses can look to. So uh, we just look forward to continuing to collaborate with the chamber to get the good message out about things that can be done to keep businesses and schools open and keep people healthy. Bruce, would you please repeat that web address one more time and we'll type it in the chat window for everyone. Sure, it's start-coalition.org. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you to everyone on the panel for sharing this really valuable information. Thanks to everyone who attended today. Remember, a recording of today's session will be emailed out to everyone on Monday. You are welcome to share that with anyone that you think could benefit from today's conversation. Thanks again to Mass Mutual Oklahoma for helping us do Enlighten another month. Um, we'll have an announcement of October topics coming soon, but the October Enlighten will be on October second. For today, we're adjourned. Thank you all for being here. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone.